Right now, I'm going to talk to you just briefly about the exciting area of collaborative learning process analysis. This is an area of text mining research in particular that is relevant for learning analytics, and it's an area in which my group does a lot of its work. In this short introduction, I'm going to motivate a theory-driven approach. In my last lecture to you, I was talking about that uh, the M&M candy example. And this is where we're going to talk about what are the ideas or what's the foundation for deciding what it is about text that you want to preserve in the representation so that you can find meaningful patterns. And so an important part of what I just want to give you a taste of is the connection between theories of learning, of social interaction, of language, uh, how we present ourselves through language, and computational modeling. And specifically, I'm going to focus on a particular kind of conversational construct called transactivity. This is a construct that is referred to very frequently in the literature on computer-supported collaborative learning, sometimes under different names. But the idea itself is a very, very common idea because it captures the essence of what happens in a knowledge building episode between students when they're actively engaged, when they're uh, getting their reasoning out on center stage and really challenging their thinking deeply. Now, I will really just be able to scratch the surface in this short lecture, but I want to point you to a chapter from the recently published International Handbook of Collaborative Learning. You'll see the uh, reference down there on the slide, and this particular chapter talks a lot about this framework and talks about the ideas that I'll be discussing in this lecture in much more depth. So that would be a really great place to dig a little bit deeper if you're interested. So I want to start out by convincing you that there's research that points in the direction of approaching text mining in a learning analytics setting the way that I am going to try to convince you of in, in this short lecture and really in this unit as a whole. And if you see here, you'll see kind of low-level, easy-to-get indicators of conversational quality that you'll find in a lot of published work on learning analytics um, as a, applied to conversational interactions. And you can see these things even in my old work in tutorial dialogue, where what we were trying to do is be able to figure out what was it about uh, conversational interactions between tutors and students that made those encounters valuable for learning. We wanted to know that because we wanted to build tutoring agents that would be effective at eliciting learning. And um, we started with these very simple to get indicators and uh, we published papers about them and in individual studies we could find sometimes that these indicators did correlate with learning outcomes and then we would Think of reasons why it made sense that we would see these patterns, and we talked about those in our papers. But the discouraging thing was that if we compared across different studies, the things that correlated significantly with learning were not consistent. Sometimes it would be one thing, sometimes another thing. And in an individual study, it was always possible to justify why it is that we were seeing the pattern that we were seeing. But ultimately, looking at all of this research over years, we came to the conclusion that these features might correlate with what's important in some particular context, but they're not really what characterizes what's valuable for learning in a conversation. Now some of that research you can find in the first journal article that's cited down there at the bottom of your screen. This was a cognitive science article that uh, talks about you know, a several year effort, about six or seven year effort of investigation in the area of tutorial dialogue where we started with the idea that what was really important in these um, encounters is that they be intensely interactive and where we characterized what it meant to be intensely interactive in a kind of shallow way along the line of some of these indicators you see listed on this slide like turn length, conversation length, number of student questions, student tutor, tutor ratio, etc. Um, and, and, and in the end we came to the conclusion that this wasn't where the action was at, that there was something more related to the cognitive processes that 
are associated with learning that we needed to be able to capture in these conversational interactions. The journal article cited below that is, uh, it comes from work that I did collaborat collaboratively with Frank Fisher's group at uh, the University of Munich. And in our collaboration, we built on a framework that was developed within his group, um, starting with the dissertation research of Armin Weinberger. And in that research, they drew from several different theories of collaborative learning and operationalized them in terms of patterns of conversational behaviors so that they would be able to measure the quality of collaborative interactions and try to associate those constructs with learning. And this idea of transactivity that I mentioned that's going to be an important focus of this particular short lecture uh, is one that was associated strongly with one of their particular dimensions uh, called Social Modes of Co-Construction in their work. And in this journal article, you can see how we built on the idea of the social modes of co-construction in our design of the feature space. And that brings us to the idea of the connection between theory and computation, where we start with the theory of learning, we operationalize it in terms of properties of conversational interactions, and then we use that understanding to motivate the kinds of features that we use in machine learning. So here's just a way of making that just a little bit more formal. It all starts in the field of psychology where we can characterize through theories of cognition, through theories of social interaction, through theories of collaborative learning, what are those processes that are associated with learning that we want to be able to capture? Or even just those supportive processes of interaction that create the environment in which the pro those um, processes of cognition can occur the way they need to in order for learning to take place. Layered on top of that understanding is what we get from the field of sociolinguistics. And, and here I mean that very broadly, where I'm drawing in not just what would uh, specifically identify itself as sociolinguistics research, but also discourse analysis and some work in text mining and uh, other areas of linguistics that touch upon language, even uh, social psychology. And in that work, you can see um, where the focus is on what conversational interactions look like, reference to these basic psychological processes and how they're reflected through language. And in particular, you can find very deep, very detailed, qualitative investigations, which are not in themselves enough to uh, fully specify a, a computational model, and yet they give us insights that we can draw from as we start to think about how we might be able to capture these processes. And so then ultimately, the field of language technologies where text mining has its foundations and the main thrust of its research, if we can build our models from an understanding that comes to us from this deep work that investigates how these psychological signals are revealed through uh, clues that we can find in the language, we can build models that will be more effective at being able to point to where these processes are occurring in an interaction, where we have some evidence of what's going on, really just clues of what's going on from what we see in the language. So now let's take a specific example of transactivity, as I introduced it earlier. And this term comes from the work of Berkowitz and Gibbs published in the 80s, where they were looking at the moral development of children, how they learned to do ethical reasoning in their interactions with one another. And they had a rather sophisticated characterization of transactivity, um, where they had about 18 different kinds of transacts that they looked at in their work. But if you boil it down to the simplest cross-cutting essence, what is a transaction? active contribution at all. The idea is that it's uh, a contribution in which reasoning is made explicit and public and where that reasoning builds on the expressed reasoning that came earlier in a conversation. And you see here an example where one student is talking about a cell model 
They're saying that they think that this tube in a cell model will get heavier over time because water will be coming in through a membrane. And the second student is building transactively on that student's statement saying, that's true, but the important point is that water can flow in, but starch can't flow out. So it elaborates the idea, it builds on and acknowledges that idea, and it's making that student's thinking and reasoning explicit. It's showing a mechanism. It's a little tricky, actually, to characterize what it means to make reasoning uh, public and explicit, but uh, that would require a much longer lecture to get into uh, in any kind of detail. But this idea of transactivity, let's think about how it has been developed over time in research. It started out in Piaget's research in the 60s, where he was investigating the, the connection between power and cognitive conflict in learning. And there he wasn't even specifically, in most cases, looking at how conversational interactions play out. And yet, there was this idea that uh, an interaction is taking place between the learner and something in the environment. It could be an object or it could be another learner. 20 years later is where Berkowitz and Gibbs' idea came along. And there, there was this idea that builds on Piaget's idea. Piaget talked about cognitive conflict. That was where a learner, because of their interactions with something in the environment, comes to understand that there's something wrong with their mental model. In sociocognitive conflict, we see in the interaction between two individuals evidence that they're coming to that understanding or that one in, one of those um, people in that interaction is coming to a, a point of cognitive conflict. Now, it's interesting that Berkowitz and Gibbs started to tie the connection between transactive contributions and sociocognitive conflict. And later, the idea of power balance, which comes from Piaget's original idea of, of, of cognitive conflict and learning, um, is connected now in, in this Kruger and Tomasello work with power balance. It's transactivity and power balance. And so they, they talk about how it is that there's a, this power balance that's associated with increased um, prevalence of transactivity. And it makes sense because in Piaget's theory, if there's a power balance between an individual and what they're interacting with, in other words, if they take their own reasoning seriously, but they also take the feedback that they're getting from the environment seriously, where these two things are in balance, they're much more likely to experience a cognitive conflict if they come in contact with something in their feedback that doesn't match their mental model. And so then building on that, Asmitia and Montgomery and their work in the 90s started to look at the idea of friendship and how friend pairs, when they collaborate together, have a higher incidence of transactivity. And you can predict that from the Kruger and Tomasello work because within a friendship you expect to have this kind of power balance that would be conducive to these cognitive conflicts occurring. And so then it's not surprising that you would see that in friend pairs you would have a higher incidence of transactivity and to the extent that transactivity promotes learning, more learning. Now in our work on transactivity, we have done analyses, as have other researchers, on how this construct, the prevalence of this construct, correlates with learning within interactions. And whereas before I talked about the fact that some of these low-level indicators were not such reliable uh, indicators of learning across studies, we find much more e evidence of generalizability with the construct of transactivity, which has its deeper roots in theories of learning. We see, for example, uh, research, and some of it is cited here, about a moderating effect on learning of transactivity. We also see a moderating effect on knowledge sharing in working groups. Now, in our computational work, we have started to play around with ways of taking our understanding of what transactivity is and where it has its roots and building that into our computational models. And I've mentioned here some published work 
in analysis of threaded discussions, transcribed classroom discussions, and also speech from dyadic discussions, in all cases with some success. And um, you'll see the full references to this work at the end of this talk, so you can dig in and read more about it if you're interested. In all cases, you can see evidence that uh, drawing ideas for feature engineering from the theory promotes um, good accuracy. Okay, so what are the takeaways from this very, very short, brief introduction? Well, um, what we see is that shallow approaches to analysis of discussion data are limited in their generality. And a theory-driven approach is more effective. It's more effective in terms of giving us a construct that has a more generalizable um, representation in the data that we have, but it's also very effective for motivating the development of our models from a technical standpoint. So in the remainder of this text unit, we'll help you start to go down this path of taking the more theory-driven approach. Again, I want to draw your attention to this chapter from the International Handbook of Collaborative Learning, where you can get more into the same story that I was trying to convey in um, this short lecture. Uh, you know, in, you can take your time and uh, chew over it, it with more details. So um, here are some of the articles that I cited in this uh, lecture, and you have the full references here uh, and also on this next slide, so you can follow up on these if you're interested, and they will give you more detail uh, for taking some next steps. And as I've said, please drop me a line if you're interested at the email address that you see on this slide. And of course, please continue to use those help affordances like the Quick Helper and the discussion forums um, and interact with your fellow students to really take advantage of the opportunity to digest this in a deeper way.